Braxis Holdout, the first map in the Grand Final. Qualifier number four is slowly coming to an end, ladies and gentlemen. And we got the Raiders going up against the Space Goofs. So, it should be a fun one. This is a best of five, by the way. And as with all the other qualifiers, there is only one single draft rule. One rule when it comes to picking and banning heroes. You can only play hero once within the same series. That's the only thing. No pre-bans, nothing crazy, but we don't want to see the same heroes over and over again. Now the qualifiers still work after the same principle. We have six qualifiers in total. This is qualifier number four. As teams progress through the qualifier, they are picking up points. The farther you go in the tournament, the more points you get. And those points get accumulated after the final qualifier and the teams at the top of the leaderboard make it then into the playoffs where they play for the $2,500 of prize money. All the prize money is sponsored by Psykiv, by Kevin. He is the, uh, the, I mean, he's pretty much the person that keeps Heroes of the Storm alive these days. Has been involved in tons of the tournaments that you've been watching here over the last two years. And yeah, the guy's awesome. He sponsors the Banshee Cup. The tournament is named after him. He's the Sylvanas one trick and therefore we named the tournament after the Banshee Queen. And without him, all of this would not be possible. So guys, we are on Brax's holdout right now. We have Mayev already banned out. Genji's getting the boot real quickly. And this should be a pretty cool one. The Raiders made a spectacular run through the winner bracket. They looked fantastic. Then we had the Space Goofs obviously uh, doing a great job in the losers bracket in particular. Game after game they were able to claim. And now we have them in a direct brawl against the Raiders for victory in qualifier number four. Sylvanas gets banned. I'm still toying with the idea of actually making Sylvanas unbannable in the in the playoffs just simply because it's the Banshee Cup. So how dare they ban Sylvanas all the time? I mean, it's kind of funny to me how often she's actually getting eliminated. It makes sense in the context of a lot of maps if you're talking Haunted Mines, for example, yeah. But still. Uh, Braxis Holder, the map choice, by the way, in case that you're unfamiliar with this, in the last tournament and this tournament, uh, so the Banshee Cup and before Meta Madness, when it came to best of five series, we determined the starting map. So we used some of, we used a lot of the maps that are not played a whole lot, Black Hearts Bay, Haunted Mines and all the stuff. In this case, Braxis Holdout. And just to make things a bit more interesting, on map number one, we determined that and then afterwards it's the usual spiel, whereas the losing team can decide whether they want to have first pick, first ban, or whether they want to choose the map. So right now we're looking at Braxis, that influences things a bit in the context that a lot of teams will opt for heroes that are very mobile that can traverse terrain Anubra comes to mind Genji I mean he's banned but still uh, Junkrat Muradin again you name it as a support Karazim gets a bit more popularity on this map too because you can always provide a dash target for him Brightwing would be another one anything that allows you to move very quickly from one lane to another and traverse terrain in the process is getting a bit of a priority for a lot of combinations that are being played now as you can obviously tell with what's happening on the blue team side they are going down a different path with this they got blaze johanna which is always a strong front line and we got hunter orc now on lucio but again for the space groups at least there's still the uh, opportunity to uh, continue with that style of draft Murden can easily hop around, Junkard obviously the same, so yeah, we'll see. Chromie gets banned. Yeah, but if anything, I would honestly be a bit worried about Tracer, who could also be picked. Gaflo has been showing Tracer several times in the tournament and could do it again here. I'm just happy that Nano is here. Nano has not overslept. Now it is 7.30 in uh, 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 7.30 p.m. But if I know one thing about Nano is that the guy has apparently the craziest sleep schedule that anybody has ever seen. So I'm just happy that he this time has not overslept because it already happened twice in qualifiers. And at least he's here now. What is he going to play though? Chromie is banned. Hanzo is banned. We could still see some mage action at the bottom of the map. I would be absolutely in favor for that. Get that wave clear going. Now... The Raiders, they have already a decent amount of wave clear. But if you want to bust out a Gul'dan, for example, that can always be neat. Junkrat can be nice, even with Riptire. If you're going up against a good objective on the opponent's side, getting a Riptire out just to eliminate that, totally worth it. Gul'dan, obviously, also bringing a lot of that. And we have Leoric for the top lane. So the side laner has already been decided. Praxis Holder can be a bit snowbally once that you take those forts out and the fountains are gone. Uh, it's becoming much harder to uh, get those checkpoints. 
and get any progress going there. But the final two picks for our first map in the best of five series, we get uh, Tracer, as I said, and we get Mephisto together with it. So Tracer, Mephisto, those are the picks and our final choice for the map, for our starting map in the best of five grand final of Banshee Cup qualifier number four goes to the Space Goofs. We are looking for some support action. You can play Karazim here. Given their draft, I don't really think they will. They could have followed up with a few other heroes, then maybe it's an option. But they go for Morales. All right. Morales it is. Haven't seen her in a hot minute. Morales on Braxis. Let's go, everybody. Game number one. Game number one, uh, the Raiders, ladies and gentlemen, on the left with Gavlo on Tracer, Hunter Org on Lucio. We get none on Mephisto, Cranklon on Jana, and Sven is playing Blaze for the blue team, coming from the winner bracket. Over on the right side, the Space Goofs with Chia Seca and Gul'dan going into a full-on Felflame build. X-Ray has decided that he wants to go full Mocus Foralis on this one. So we get life support as the first choice for the Lieutenant. Yasu with Junkrat, play on Muradin, and Dequaza is playing Leoric. So if I didn't expect one thing here, <laughs> then it is Morales. <laughs> That came a bit out of nowhere. Not really a hero that you see. I cannot even remember when I've seen Morales the last time where it wasn't forced because 50,000 supports were unavailable for play. In Meta Madness, you see Morales. But in an actual game where there's no hero eliminated yet and where you really have the pick of the litter, I don't, rem I don't think we ever had that. So it's kind of bonkers. But hey, I'm totally here for it. The, uh, the only context in which I sometimes see Morales is honestly when we're casting the lower leagues and somebody wants to go for a backdoor strategy. Doesn't really happen a lot and nearly always backfires, but this is the only time when you actually see Morales, when somebody wants to cheat. And a little bit of a spoiler alert here, the comp that they have does not lend itself to a backdoor strat. It's just not a thing. You don't have Sanctification Tyriel, there's no Falstead here to buy you some space. They don't have anybody that is particularly strong on structures. So, yeah, they can't play that. With a 2-3 split, and the first one to fall is Gul'dan. Murden in the meantime, is already uh, trying to <laughs> solo against three as they are starting to go for camps. But yeah, it's still a little bit wild. I honestly want to see what X-Ray has in mind with this, because this is not a typical pick. Not even close. So, yeah. Maybe they can move between the lanes a little bit faster if they really want to go for the dropship, but I think it's a bit more likely that we're still going to get the attack speed. Anyways, now as the first objective is up, the beacon progress has already started and the blue team is off to a pretty solid lead, 26-28% as we are starting things in. So, not too bad. Play jumping out and trying to escape here so that his uh, trade can also kick in. But they are already chasing them down a little bit. And the Space Goofs are honestly on a bit of a run, obviously. They've been doing really well in the lower bracket, so they are coming off a couple of wins now. They've already been playing in the first series today, so they won two matches previously. One against the Cats and one against Team Ash, even taking down the Svenskas. Three matches in total, therefore, so a long day for them, but it also means that they've really found their rhythm here, and they're in the zone. Now, if they can translate that into some solid momentum against the blue team, who have so far not played today, I mean, they probably had a warm-up or something, but they haven't had to play any actual matches, if they can pull that now through and gain that momentum, uh, then it would be pretty sweet. So we got a level 4, the Thunderburn, we got the Ghastly Reach in as well. And with 38%, it's already a nice cushion for the blue team. Top side, we still have a control attempt. Blue team has still lost the beacon, so yeah. If they can now down at the bottom of the map also gain control, the Space Goose might just be able to get a couple of points for their own thing. So the attacks keep coming. And the, the water's already been damaged a little bit. 
And now they're starting to take over. So this is actually where st things start to shift slightly. At the top, the blue team is starting to move against Leoric and are forcing him back with Junkrat retreating to top off his hit points. That means that they can at least reclaim that, but it's now 38 to 32 percent. And keep in mind, this is not a winner takes all. So at this point, every single percentage point that you gather for your team is going to uh, strengthen the wave that you are going to get. So uh, this can make for some pretty interesting scenarios. But at least at this point, it seems that we're going to get a significant lead for the Raiders. Maybe they're even getting 100% here against 32. And that would be a very strong Zerg wave. And indeed, they get it. It's going to travel through the bot lane where the wall has been slightly damaged, but nowhere near taken out. And the battle isn't even over yet. Morales still with the heels here. And now they have to face the music against this big push. And this is Gul'dan. He really needs to shine here. Needs to come in with all of that fell flame, fell flame pressure that he has. And he has plenty of it. So he's going to try and take him down as quickly as possible. But they're losing not only the wall. They also are going to lose some of the hit points on the four. That's already guaranteed. The only question at the end of the day is really how much of that are they going to, to lose. They have to lose the entire thing. That would be uh, kind of annoying because, as explained previously, the problem on this map is oftentimes once you lose the fort, you don't have a fountain, and that makes any fight for a beacon so much harder. Makes it really, really tricky. But they are able to save the fort for now. No real problems here. Top side, also the wall was lost. Not that big of a difference, honestly. It's the first objective. Hasn't scaled all that heavily. And Nano might be in trouble down here. And indeed he is. Mephisto goes down. He gets killed. No chance for him. We now have level 8 talents. Uh, so level 8. Level 8 kicking in soon. Level 7 talents, of course, ready for both of them. But extremely uh, open game just now. Nobody taking a big lead just yet. Nothing too bonkers happening. But they're all willing to go for fights, as you can already tell. So yeah, they're starting to make their moves here. Attempting to steal a couple of the camps away, which up to now at least has not really worked out. But since the beacon is not active, that's the only thing that they can fight over. And the red team is not shying away from any confrontation, so they are trying to go in. But they might lose a few heroes now as a result. They're losing Gul'dan, they're losing Junkrat. The rest of the team at the bottom of the map is already rushing away. Leoric also escaping, but with who, two heroes already dropped. They're now risking losing Morales. She falls. Mirrodin, he... Oh, is he gonna die too? Yep, he is. Four heroes eliminated. Four heroes go down as they are starting to crush the opponent. And that opens the bottom fort up to additional damage. And it gets very, very quickly dished out. So the fort is gone. And that is a level lead, ladies and gentlemen. They're ahead by entire level already. The fort destroyed. Could maybe even steal a couple of these camps away. The beacons are activating in 30 seconds. And they are trying to just drive that momentum home. They're going for level 10. They got the Durance of Hate now. We get the high five. And it's just all about maintaining momentum, stealing camps away, going for the objective, and just really murder them. That's, at the end of the day, the gameplay here, or at least the attempt. And as long as level 10 isn't ready for the red team, they can't really do anything about it. I mean, what are they going to do? Fight against an opponent that has heroic abilities already? You might as well commit honorable Sudoku. You're not going to stand a chance. So the choice is honorable Subaru or just sitting back, waiting for level 10, get some experience and yeah, try to avoid fights for as long as you possibly can. But they got to give up the map. If anything surprises me, then it's the fact that the second beacon hasn't taken yet. But the blue team has swarmed it with their entire team. And even if you don't have level 10, you can still outnumber an opponent easily. Garflo has used that chance to move to the bottom of the map and push the catapult in a bit deeper. In addition to that, we now have more camps taken right over here. And of course, it's still an opportunity to potentially go for move. Haymaker, by the way. And there's the dropship. Dropship is in, so they indeed chose Morales to try and move between the lanes, amongst other things. If that's going to work for them, congratulations, but I'm still having a few doubts here. Chia's about to go down, and yep, he's dead. Chia Seca dies. 
That's Gul'dan gone. Six kills to one overall. And with Junkrat eliminated, the only loss that they are suffering is Lucio. They're even going for Morales again. But the top side forward is taking damage because of the camp and the minion wave. They have to deal with that. The progress is starting on the beacon as well. Nice and Tomb though. But the bunker is eliminating all the... They, they, it's eliminating the entire threat level. They still lose Jojo then towards the end. Muradin is barely getting out though. And as you can tell, the fight isn't even over. First of all, the fort is about to get dropped, which means that the top fountain is now gone. But they're also losing more ground as everybody has to retreat. Muradin moved in a bit deeper to take topside control of the beacon. That prevents the objective from being 100 to 0 or 100 to 18. You're getting a little bit of a pittance whenever your opponent takes the objective, but it's already bad enough as is. And they're continuing the party right here, and this time they're gonna grab it. Really? Backdoor against the keep? Um, okay. <laughs> That's game. That's game. They are so dead. They're so dead. They're all dead and they're not gonna accomplish anything. If you wanna go for a backdoor strategy, this isn't it. This is not it. Let me just say that. Four heroes are dead. They accomplished absolutely nothing. So that was a troll and a half. They knew that too. They've pretty much given up at this point. There is no way that anybody can convince me that they actually thought that had a chance of success. I mean, like all of them literally dying without even scratching the key past the 75% hit point mark. So, that was a backdoor Sudoku if I've ever seen one. <laughs> I mean, damn, they, they really, really don't like playing on this map, do they now? So, they, the, the space goofs, they got a little bit too spacey and too goofy. And they're trying the same thing again, so they're just going for keeps at this point. Morales can't even keep Leoric alive, so now she's running away. And yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Getting killed by minions. Congratulations, X-Ray. Gets a grenade out and is hearthing away, but as you can tell, the core is already falling. Gul'dan is gone, and this is all she wrote. Leo is literally just trying to spawn on keep. This is a lead in the best of five series for the Raiders, everybody. They win it on Praxis Holdout. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Aldrich Pass, game number two. Finally. So apparently Yasu is having some problems from the looks of it and has some weird disconnects when we're starting drafts again. But he managed... The third time's the charm. He managed to solve it. We are in game number two. We have in the grand final the Raiders in the lead now. A 1-0. Yeah, and Aldrich Pass is our second map. So let's see what exactly we're going to get this time. First pick, first ban on the side of the space goofs. And damn, they got a little bit goofy on the last one, didn't they? Either they really spaced out or they got a bit too goofy. But <laughs> that team Sudoku that they executed there... That was not really a backdoor. I think at this point they just realized that the game was lost. They lost both of their forts. They got farmed. They lost the objective again and it was 100 to 0 essentially. So they just decided, okay, let's end it. And congratulations because they found the surrender button. They definitely did. Morales flying in and just suiciding all of them straight into the keep. Definitely put an end to the first game pretty quickly. So now we're heading into Aldrich Pass and we'll see what they can do here. The one thing honestly that worries me slightly when we're talking about game number two is that we headed into the lobby. And then play immediately was like, uh, wait, can we ban maps? And <laughs> everyone on the side of the radar was like, what are you talking about ban maps? You already banned maps. You banned Dragonshire. And he's like, well, but can we only ban one? And I was like, yeah, because this is a best of five series. So you can only ban one. In best of threes, you're banning two each team. And in best of fives, you're banning only one. He's like, oh, okay, okay. So I have a feeling that they don't like playing Aldrich Pass. <laughs> so we'll see what they're going to do here. But I think that at least Play was pretty unhappy that he has to play on Aldrich. And if they had a chance to ban an additional map, it would have been this one. Now... Does that mean that they have zero experience here? I don't really think so, but they were for sure slightly confused. Now, to be fair to them, they have played now... This is the fourth series in a row that they are playing. They played three best of threes, and this is their fourth match of the day. 
That is, by the way, the big advantage when you're coming through the winner bracket, that you don't have to play this many games in a row. You're not sitting there tired because you've been playing game after game after game. You could sit there with a margarita, watch your opponents play, think about what you would do if they make it into the grand final, what heroes you would want to ban, what maps you want to play. So the Raiders, while they might have had a warm-up, they're chilled, they're relaxed, and the space goofs, they're tired, they're hopped on on caffeine, they've drank coffee all day or some energy drinks, so they're now shaking like Malfurion in a selection screen. And that is the downside if you have to make this massive loser's bracket run. Genji as a quick pick, and we get Rhaegar. It's kind of unfortunate. If I see Genji as a first pick, the one thing that I immediately want to see is Anduin. That light bomb and is just funny. Maybe I'm also doing them some injustice here. Maybe they haven't gone for margaritas. You know what I didn't have in a long time? A nice white Russian. I didn't have a white Russian in a long time. Which honestly reminds me, I should go to a proper bar here and find one that actually makes one. That would be pretty good. There's a lot of bars here that have like cocktails, but I haven't really looked for a white Russian lately. And I honestly like that drink quite a bit. But yeah, uh, slightly off topic. A new Barak and URL. That's always a go-to combo. Anubar Iraq Urel is always a go-to. Koreans loved to play this. Oh boy, at every Eastern Clash. It was the go-to pick that you're trying to deny to your opponent and lock in for yourselves. Cassia is coming through. And we got X-Ray with Uther. So Divine Shields galore on Aldrak. And with Anubarak you can of course still cheese the objective. Well, you could. But nobody knew that you could do it. But now that everybody does, most of the time you're not really able to pull it off anymore because everybody is watching when Anubarak disappears from the map and kind of know what's going on there. But okay, so red team with the final ban of game number two. Keep in mind, this is a best of five indeed. We got Malthael, so he's eliminated and that leaves us on the blue team side with the next double pick. And I still hope that Sven is busting out Samoro. This is a big map. This is a good map if he wants to do it. Could go for traditional side laner. Nano hasn't made a choice yet either, so we could still Hanzo it up and go double Shimada on this one. Time will tell. Garrosh. Ooh, it's hammer time. Okay. Nano with Sergeant Hammer. Okay. Garrosh to keep them away. And Nubrak and Urel can try and dive in. I mean, they obviously already saw what they were up against. But me likey. Now we're still looking for the side lane, and yeah, what is also what these Yasu going to take here now? They know what they're up against. If you're playing against Hammer, it's always the same. You know, someone need to crack the code there. Abatha, they go slug. Abatha, Urel, Abatha, Grayman, Abatha, Nuburak. I like it. This is going to be fun. We are getting a Slabatha already. Slap it, baby. Go deep on this one. That's Sven as the final pick. Abatha obviously has a couple of really neat advantages, but he also means that you are most of the time missing one hit point pool in the fights unless you have a copy cooldown after level 10. And our final pick is the Vikings. Nice. Okay. Stage is set. I like it. Strong foreman. Vikings once again to soak things up. Space Goofs in the grand final. Game number two of the best of fives going up against the Vinland Raiders. Game number two, the 1-0 lead for the blue team. The Raiders are ahead as we have Gavlo on Sergeant Hammer. They gave the Panzer to the German. Never a good idea. Nano's playing Genji. We got Sven on the Vikings, Crankle on Garrosh, and Hunter Org on Rega. To the right side of the map, the Space Goofs with Abatha against the Vikings. Yazu playing the hero. X-Ray rocking Uther. We got Dequaz on Urel. Chiaseka on Greymain. And Play is playing a Nubarak in the second game of this best of five series. So Sven is going to try and apply the pressure here and also deal with Abatha a little bit, especially in the early stages. 
And it can be a pretty powerful pick to go Vikings here, of course, too, since once again the same rule applies that you have so many different points on the map that you're attempting to control. But a very neat start at the top as the Anubarak and Grey main combo go straight for a tower. The idea always being the same. You're just trying to go into a lane where your opponent doesn't expect you. Anubarak spawns a couple of beetles that soak the tower shots and then Grey main gets the damage in. And he does that also against Rega. In Germany we call that dumm gelaufen. He literally walked the uh, probably dumbest path he could probably take. Unbeknownst to him, of course, so <laughs> ran straight into them. And they just said thank you very much and got the kill. And then Garrosh decided that he wants to give them a present as well. So that's two kills already. Space groups with two kills to zero. And thanks to all the kills that they're getting, they're also going for structures. Um, yeah. Unverhofft kommt oft. I don't think that they necessarily expected that they would get so many presents, and it's not even their birthday, as far as I know. But they are definitely going to take that. So, great. <laughs> this is fantastic for them. <laughs> they get a couple of freebies in the early game, they take most of the wall down, lead an experience. This is about as good as it gets, particularly when you're playing an Abathur comp, where you are trying to get to level 10 as quickly as you possibly can. So, they're going to be very happy with this. Camps are already taken now, but yeah, this is a glorious start for the team in red and much, much better than what we saw in game number one. So, good job. Or, oh, well, <laughs> maybe not necessarily a good job by them, but it's definitely... They capitalized on mistakes the opponents made. Let's put it like this. Try to be a bit diplomatic here. Genji? Nano is getting away, but they are really having some trouble with their coordination, don't they? Nano dropping this low, hearthing back out. He nearly died there. This could have been a kill. But Sergeant Hammer is still going for uh, the middle of the map. Now, the one problem that the blue team is currently facing is that half of the plan, obviously, is to just push and siege up with Sergeant Hammer. But Greyman is absolutely spectacular when you're talking about destroying structures. So he can also outpush heavily. If you're only dealing with Vikings, and Nubarak just spawns a few beetles, and you are just going in with Greyman and you rip structures apart. So instead of the red team reacting to Hammer, we now have, because of the early game, the Raiders reacting to Greyman. Not necessarily what you're envisioning when you're picking this particular draft. So, yeah. Top side, they get a kill finally. So Nubarak goes down. They're able to drop him. And now Sergeant Hammer is taking position. So they're shifting their focus from the mid lane towards the top lane instead. Trying to ensure that the fort that already was damaged earlier is not going to run into problems. So they take the wall down slowly here. Of course, with Abathur in the mix, once that he hits level 7, you also need to be super careful that you're taking structures down, that you're not just damaging them, or he just drops a mule on you, and you're going to be in trouble. But the same principle is applying once more. So they're going now down at the bottom of the map for another move, as they are trying to use Greyman in these positions to make the plays. Gavlo at the top is also getting followed by Urel, who might even get the kill. Comes in and... Oh, just jumps away, Dequaza. Not like this. No, he gets away. Not even close. Damn, so he's able to get a kill and he gets out of the fight too. Once that he missed the jump, I really thought that would be it for him. But nope, he gets the kill on Sergeant Hammer and then simply rushes away here. Nicely done. That's kill number three for the red team. So, yeah, pretty, pretty sweet. So, that is a fantastic start for the red team and it's honestly not really looking all that good for uh, their opponents. I mean, we'll see how this continues to play out, but suffice it to say that at least initially the Raiders are reacting way more than they bargained for. They wanted to be the ones that drive the bus here, that make the plays, and instead they're reacting to uh, the moves of Greymane and the red team. Another kill comes in, Garrosh gets destroyed, and we might be in for a really nice back and forth here. I got worried when Play was asking about banning another map and getting rid of Alderac even. But this is looking exceptionally good for them. Sergeant Hammer is now gone. I mean, they are just murdering them. Kill after kill. Five kills to one now. <laughs> and this is getting nasty. So, yeah. Making moves in the middle of the map now too. Maybe. Top side, Sven. He's pushing this back with Baylock. I mean, he has the wave clear here. But the camp is likely going to be 
I mean, maybe not quite lost yet, but it's a significant advantage. I mean, they're halfway done with the, with the thing. And it's half a level until level 10, so that makes matters even worse. Uh, Sven is already down here. Still trying, of course, to get them into a proper experience range and all of this. But, yeah, this is getting a bit nasty. Nano's cloud already got sad. That was a happy cloud when they started the game. When they started into the game, that cloud was still happy. And now it's pretty sad. And for very good reason, because this is a sad game for them. Level 10 with a bullet for Greymane. We get the copy for Abertha, as you would expect. And since they are still trying to get the objective, there's the stun. Yeah, Cocoon! And that should be the first set of Raiders for the Space Goofs. They go for Genji. Bullet is out. He went into Divine Storm over Divine Shield. And even with Sarge and Hammer being saved here, that's still a problem. Yasu <laughs> nearly got Rega killed, but there's no doubt anymore. The first one is taken. They're grabbing the Raiders. Objective number one goes straight to the Space Goops. And in addition to that, they're now also taking even more structures out. So not only did they damage the top fort severely, they were also able to do a whole lot down at the bottom of the map. They are probably going to take this entire thing away from them. So, yeah, things are not looking good to say. I mean, be polite here. Hey, they're looking pretty shitty. Seven kills to one. You're trying a Viking comp and you're behind in experience now. You've lost map control. It's not like you gained anything here. So, they are in uh, dire straits. They really have some serious problems. And the bad breath of Garrosh is only one of them. So, down goes Uther. Maybe a chance to bring it back a little bit. That's a good one, but they need a lot more if they want to have an uh, opportunity to take control of the game again. They lost the bottom four. They're losing the top four too. So this one is also gone. The only one that they can save is in the middle of the map. But, yeah. I mean, at least they have, both teams have now heroic abilities, you know? You're playing around Napalm a bit. But let's see what they can do. Sven gets killed. Well, one of the Vikings gets killed. He didn't lose all of them. But they gotta stabilize. They are clearly shaken. They've been clearly shaken by the bad early game. And now have to somehow come back into the game here. So still something that you can salvage. But what the red team is trying to do is just keep up the momentum. And after they've done all of that work with now the Raiders. With the top fort, bot fort. They are making a move for the bottom boss. Now, if this gets not only sniffed out, but stolen away, then it's a different story. But keep in mind that they are, okay, they're getting all the Vikings involved now. They're trying to go for the point. If they win the fight, they're back in. If they lose it, it's a disaster. They're losing the Vikings slowly. There's the quest completed for Genji as they're going for Nuburak to drop the main tank of the red team. The boss about to be taken, but they're still swarming the spot. And Uta goes down. Uta dies. Greyman's still in play, but not for much longer. He wants to go for Rega and gets him. Boss claimed by the red team. How about the kills now? Yep, it's a kill against Sarchnema, against Garrosh, and Nano is maybe getting out if he can run away fast enough, and indeed he can, but it doesn't change the fact that the fight was not only won by the red team, they also took the boss in the process. There might have been a few counter kills, but not enough to tip the scales of this game, and this is just looking still fantastic for the space scoops. Better and better as they are making their moves. They're really pinning the blue team down and they can now go for even a second push at the top and to make matters worse mule in action mid lane got damaged a bit and abatha drops it right away so while the blue team is defending the red team moves towards the top side to take another fort out here and they have a two level lead now uh, take another fort out take another boss out and then potentially even go for the keep so yep pretty well done 11 kills, 2-4, and well, at the same time now, we're having the uh, mid lane also getting pressured. Just a bit. But again, it doesn't really matter because you have a mule against you. Either you take the four down or you don't, but at this point, if you just left them like that, then you're not going to accomplish anything. So Sergeant Hammer just poking away at this and slowly taking the hit points down is not enough. They need to really go for the finishing blow, and this just hasn't happened for them yet. So, uh, at the top lane, the boss is moving in, will break through the wall at least. And here's level 16. We got the Executioner for Greymane, we got the Epicenter. Benediction is ready. 
They still can defend easily. We're only 10 minutes in right now. But, yeah, it's just uh, rough going for the blue team. And honestly, it doesn't really feel like they have a chance to get back into this. I mean, maybe they can somehow win a team fight, but the one at the boss at the bot lane was already a pretty decisive one, and they just couldn't turn it around there. So, at this point, it's the next play over at the top side prisoner camp. And with only 10 seconds left, it's getting uh, more and more likely that the space groups grab objective number two. There's another big stun. Great ancestral by Rega to save Genji. Anubrak is low, but we definitely are getting raiders again for the space groups. So, with that, Hunter Orc on the run. Yeah, and Anubrak is the one to fall. Anubrak goes down. He is the one eliminated. We got also Baylock destroyed. Not that it really matters too much if you lose a Viking or two. But with 11 kills to 5 and now an objective coming in, the only one missing is the Nubarak. So yes, you might not be able to fully commit to this because you're still lacking your main tank. We got 33,000 damage now for Greymane, 36,000 for Sergeant Hammer. And at the bottom of the map, Uther is already starting to pressure this out a little bit. All the way up at the top, we have the next set of raiders coming through. And they're going to take damage on some of those keeps, at least. I don't think that one is really going to get destroyed just yet. But it just continues the trend. And with level 60 now for the blue team, this is honestly the best phase in the game to start making a comeback. If they're not able to make it now, then they never will. Losing the forts is bad, but it's not the end of the game. If you're losing keeps, that's a totally different story, particularly on all direct pass where you lose armor shields on the core. So, big issue. But again, with this, we're now having uh, the bot lane keep taking some damage, top lane keep has taken a little bit, not a lot. But just opening the walls up is already a big step into the right direction for the red team. They have the stun now, though. So we're now looking at large and in charge, and we got the Earth Grasp Totem. Those are two big ones. And Executioner also for Sergeant Hammer. So there's definitely a couple of nice tools that are added at level 16 that might just allow the blue team to slowly turn this one. But if they really want to pull it off, as I said before, now is the time. Either you do it now, or you will just slowly give up on this. That's a nice kill. Uther gets murdered. Has no Divine Shield, only Divine Storm. And he's not the only one that falls. They're going for a new Burak and they're quickly dropping him too. So that's an easy peasy double kill that plays into a 5 versus 3 situation that should at least grant them the mid lane fort. So maybe the team isn't done just yet. Maybe, just maybe, the blue team still has an opportunity here. There's no camp up, but they can now go down to the bottom of the map and work on the next fort. Boss is also coming up soon, TM, I believe. Yep, only three more seconds. So here's the chance. They got a fourth. They're going to get boss here. So simply because two heroes are missing. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Maybe they have an opportunity to still come back here. As I said before, once, as long as you don't lose keeps, you're still technically fine. So you can start that comeback. And just look how these few kills that they picked up, how much experience that gave them. With the help of the Vikings, they are currently at level 19, as is their opponent. So, they lead in minion experience, which they should because of the Vikings. Hero experience is nearly even, because the heroes, when they killed them, were a much higher level. They're going to eliminate that bottom fort now with the help of the boss. And that is fantastic news for the blue team. They looked like they were sure to lose this one. Like there was absolutely no chance to save this in any way, shape or form. But maybe there's a path back into the game after all. 19 and a half versus 19 and a half. Red team has lost two of their forts now. So the difference in structures is not that big. And level 20 talents are also going to play a big role here, of course. Boss at the top. Play is already sniffing it out. They're double checking. They see the copy. They know what's coming and they're immediately retreating. And the Abitha copy is gone within seconds. Abathar copy is insta-deleted. Insta. Vikings are pushing the bot lane. They're still going for boss. Urel and Greymane are arriving and might just be here in time. Boss, they try to take it. Red team nearly steals it. They're still fighting for it. There's the ancestral and they have to follow up. Red team steals the boss but loses. Nope, they're taking two heroes down. Steals the boss, loses Uther who has redemption and maybe the raiders just killed themselves.
I think the Raiders might have just screwed up enough to lose the game right here, right now. We got a kill against Sergeant Hammer, and I suppose this might be it. It's a bit of a dicey one, because even with Rhaegar dying now, it's only one armor shield that gets removed if you're going for uh, the top side keep. There's probably plenty of time, and with the help of the boss, I suppose they can go for the core directly. You don't see too much. Lately, I actually have seen it a little bit more often. But yeah, they're gonna go for core here, but it's still bonkers. The Raiders just screwed themselves. They had their ticket back into the game, and they just ripped it apart threw it away into the trash can and said, you know what, we don't need it. We're going to put this series into a best of three. We're going to tie it up right now. And with a 1-1, we're heading into the next map. Nicely done, well played. Raiders lose on all direct pass. The Space Goofs victorious on the second map of the best of five series here at the grand final of the fourth qualifier. Nicely done, GG, and well played. Game number three, Tomb of the Spider Queen, ladies and gentlemen. The series is tied as the Space Goofs just absolutely crushed Aldrich Pass. Now, I gotta admit that it felt a bit like the Raiders, uh, <laughs> the typical meme with the guy on the bicycle that pulls a stick through his wheel or through his spokes comes to mind because they kind of screwed themselves. They got murdered in the early game. Then they came back in a really nice fight, they take two forts down, they're drawing even an experience, they take a boss, then they go for the top side boss, and <laughs> lose the fight, get crushed, lose the boss, lose the heroes, and the space goof just says, uh, thank you very much, we're gonna take that, we're gonna take the win, moved on and claimed it. So now we're heading into game number three, the series is tied. Keep in mind, there is only one draft rule, you cannot draft a hero more than once within a series. Well play the hero more than once in the series. Rule is simple, we just don't want to see heroes over and over and over and over again. So 20 heroes are now unavailable. Now it's not really a big deal, again we have 90 heroes in the pool so you can always go for a great comp. If you're not going for additional pre-bans which is exclusive for Meta Madness as a tournament concept, then you're not going to end up, you know, with like all supports banned out or something crazy like that. If you're interested in that, you should look up the Meta Madness playlist on my YouTube channel. There you find exactly that, where teams are running out of supports, where you can't play anything anymore, where you bust out your murky Phoenix combo and other stuff. That's what that tournament is for. Here in the Banshee Cup, it's supposed to be a little bit more normal, but we still don't want to have every single game be the Hanzo show. So just as a little reminder, the two heroes previously cannot be played again. So we're going to keep a bit of an eye on that. But let's see what the teams are now pulling off on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen. Uh, well, we got Hogger Band, Diablo got the axe as well. And now it's time for the first pick. And it's Mayev, Mayev for Gavlo. Alright, me likey. And it should actually be pretty nice here to just see the wave clear come in again. And since we are moving into game number three, there's always also a chance that you get some heroes that are a little bit more out of the box. I mean, to the Spider Queen is a map where you can technically bust out the occasional Nazebo. And some of the teams have already shown an affinity to play heroes that you would normally not always see here. I mean, <laughs> morale is in game number one. There's Hanzo, and we get Anduin. So, yeah, I kind of want to keep that away from Nano. There's a few more that they can still play, though. Nano, when it comes to Majors, for example, we could still see Mephisto. Kalthas is another one with a good gravity lapse that would be pretty sweet. So, another good hero for them to take. Dequaza, still curious what he's going to go for. He played, once again, an exceptional Urel in the last game. He had such a huge impact with Urel in so many team fights, particularly assisted by Abatha. It was bonkers. Now we're getting Malfurion and Zul for the blue team. So, Zul again for these quick rotations between lanes. Another hero on the front line that has still not been played is Stitches. Just saying, if you want to go for a globe-heavy performance, then Stitches can be played on this one. And just try and get as big of a hit point pool as possible. I still remember the first time that in Meta Madness, it was, I believe, Stalk that played Stitches with Hungry for More. And he ended up with 13,000 hit points. They just couldn't kill him in the end. They just couldn't. 
So, yeah, if we get something like that, Tomb of the Spider Queen would be a good map to test it out. I just want to see a team that at some point goes Alexstrasza, Stitches on Tomb of the Spider Queen and just literally makes Stitches into an unkillable monster. With Alexstrasza providing globes, with the lanes being so close together that you're getting globes there too. So, yeah, it would be pretty fun if eventually this is going to happen. But it's more of a meme comp, more of a quick match thing. But we get Stitches. Stitches is there. So, Stitches is in the house. We have Kel'thas together with it. So, you get already your hook straight into Gorge, Gravity Labs, Anduin Root. There's a lot that they can already pull off with it. I mean, you could even go into Anduin Meme Strike. Uh, sorry, Hanzo Meme Strike with that. Oriel. And the last pick, Fanano. I think he might have wanted to play Kel'thas, honestly. Nano has played Kel'thas quite a lot. But yeah. There we go. Vala is the final pick. Double support, Vala. They go for it. They have Zul now as a main tank with the double support. Definitely doable. And Deathwing as the final choice. Tomb of the Spider Queen, everybody. Let's go and make it happen. Game number three in the best of five series here at the grand final of qualifier number four. Game number three. Raiders and Space Goofs are tied. And now we have our double support comp on the left side. Oriel and Malfurion. Hunter Org on Malfurion, Crankle on Oriel. We have Sven on Zul as the main tank for the Raiders with Gavlo coming in on Maiev. Now the main damage is obviously going to come from Nanu who went into an auto attack style with Vala. I mean, duh, because double support. But it's going to be nice here. Gambit stack on level 1. We get on the right side the Space Goofs with play on Stitches. Shaseka is playing Anzo. Yazu on Anduin. Deathwing gets played by Dequaza. And we got X-Ray with Mana Addict playing Kalthas. Ashalanor. Salami. And they go immediately for Malfurion and just burst him into the ground. That's a new record. What was that? 15 seconds into the game and he's already dead? Nicely done. Nicely done. So, insta-kill on him. At least Vala got a couple of stacks together, but they did not show any mercy. Oh, they're also not showing any mercy for uh, Stitches. By the way, Dequaza is again going into the turkey skin, which I absolutely don't condone. I mean, this is ugly. This is disgusting. Deathwing is a majestic dragon that deserves a jade skin, or at least the standard black one. But when we're looking at that, that is an oversized turkey that only belongs into an oven so that we can eat him later. Absolutely disgusting. Dequaza, that's a yellow card right there. I'm sorry, but once if you pull it off once more in the series, then you're going to be out of the tournament. You're going to get the boot. I'm going to talk to the admins. This is unacceptable. This is disrespectful to, Ad uh, to Deathwing. It's disrespectful to all the viewers. It's like, blah, blah, blah. No, no, just no. Nope. So, yeah. Horrible skin. Turkey skin. Blah. The chicken. That's a lot of KFC baskets right there. Back in the bucket, my friend. Anyways, one kill to zero. Still with Malfurion being bursted down in the early game. But the main goal is to keep Vala alive. That's going to be the big one. So, and Vala has a big target. <laughs> that, that stitches. He's a big boy, he's a big target, and he is being turned to dust quickly. Makes it out of the fight, which is kind of crazy. That could have been a kill for sure. Now they're... Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't dumb at all. That was not dumb at all. Stitches thought he was so smart in this one. At least my F died too, but yeah, that was Stitches like, get over. Uh. <laughs> too damn good. I gotta be honest, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I did not expect that at all. Neither did anyone else, I'd say, but yeah. Two kills, two one. Five to four on the levels. Vala now with 40 stacks already. But yeah, glorious. Glorious hook, glorious kill. And still the same problem here. Whip into the wall. Nicely done. The problem for Vala was that she wasn't close enough to get any stacks on stitches. But yes, they are using them him as a pin cushion whenever they get an opportunity. But yeah, pretty entertaining stuff here. Stitches. I mean, again, if you can hook, you hook, right? 
see a hook, go for a hook. That's the only thing that you have. So uh, there's just no choice. If you can see it, if you can envision it, then you gotta go for it. And Stitches is again saved by Anduin, but it doesn't change the fact that Vala in every single one of these instances can come in and can do uh, some damage. Hunter Hawk for a second in trouble, but again they're running a double support for a reason, so they have a whole lot of sustain that they can utilize here, which is exactly what they're doing. Zul at the bottom of the map, still playing in the side lane position, but he's going to join the fray later on and do his thing. I'm actually surprised that he doesn't rotate more than he does already. They're also attempting to turn in as we speak. Level 7 is kicking in a little bit sooner. Ah, well, Kels does, of course, with more flame strikes. Wants the follow ups too, and Crankle with another like, quick whip into the wall, whipping stitches into shape a little bit. Bala now with 59 stacks. Now keep in mind, the Gambit stack, obviously, if you lose any... Uh, if you lose your life, if you die a few times, then you're losing the auto attack speed advantage that the Gambit gives you. But she's still getting those additional hits in. And at least right now, she's doing really well. So far, Nano hasn't really been hit by a hook. We're having uh, real nice damage being done by him. He's going for stitches most of the time. The two supports are also having his back. So they are starting this off quite nicely. Turn-ins looking a bit better for the red team though. They already have 41 gems turned in, but it seems like this is going to change now with Crankle and Nano turning in at the same time. So they are pulling slightly ahead and have a chance to now get their web weavers too. Not 100% there yet, but they are getting closer and closer. So red team turning in at the bottom of the map, but they're a bit too late to the party because Gavlo has already done the same up here at the top turning point. And now we get the web weavers for the blue team. Vala also still sitting tight here. Crankle is trying to prevent them from moving over to the next lane. So pretty much gatekeeping this and uh, allowing for Vala to take the entire wall down. That is going to make it easier for the web weavers to get more damage through all of this. And they should be concerned about their top side forward because this could be something that they're losing now. Whip comes out once again against X-Ray. Zul and Maev now both in the middle of the map. Up here at the top, it's only Vala together with the double support. And they're going for Aurel. But Vala is at 67 stacks now. And with Gavlo making a move, trying the tether, they have to be careful. Web Beavers are down, but the attack against the Ford isn't yet. So they're trying to get more here. And Vala, talking about more, is getting more and more stacks. 76, works a few more in. Sits at nearly 80 now. And they are also still damaging the fort. They might be able to take this entire thing out eventually. Maybe even here. Crankle about to die. Is going down. But there's only one more hit missing. And this fort is gone. So as far as the first objective in the game goes, this isn't too bad. Hanzo's arrow as they're hitting level 10 misses. And that's good news for the blue team. Because they didn't have level 10 yet. Ooh, Gavlo. Okay, gets away. Needs to wait for the hook and dodge out. Nope, doesn't even come in. So level 10 on both sides in just a moment, but it was definitely a bit sooner in play for the red team. And if the arrow from Hanzo connected, that could have been a bit of a disaster. The fort is still taken out. That will help them to spawn some catapults, but Stitches is looking for the hook. And Gorge gets one, gets two, and might get the entire deal now. There's the light bomb and the gravity lapse follow up. Really well done. Beautiful. Light bomb with perfect timing here. I really like that play. You don't see that all that often, but they executed that incredibly well on the timing side. They got a light bomb just when the target was dropping out of uh, stitches out of the gorge and it allowed them to get the follow-up gravity laps without any problems whatsoever. So easy kill against Mayev as you can see here. Great comp to execute. Four kills to one now, and the space goof are starting to uh, yeah, really show them how it's done. Malfurion gets hit once, twice, but there's no follow-up, and Gavlov moved in from the side too to help out. So it's a four versus four, and they don't really want to play that one out. Now, Vala has still not died and is still getting stacks. I mean, as the game continues, I really think their scaling is going to be exceptional. But that always hinges on Vala not falling and the two supports doing the best to ensure that nothing is going to get lost here. So we'll see if they can do that. There's a few gems that have been lost, actually a fair amount, if you're thinking about it. We have now another turn-in available for the red team, but they're losing stitches. Maybe, maybe not. Anduin with initial save. 
Light Bomb, not enough. And finally, Vala is able to go in, get the kill, get even the second quest reward for her level one. So Nano is still working this one in very nicely. Top Ford has been destroyed previously. Now they're going for the one in the middle. And they're going to get this one too. Question just is, can they get out of the fight as well? Because that's the next problem that they're facing. And it seems like they can. Deathwing wanted to go for Malfurion, doesn't get the kill. Gavlo is still slicing and trying to get a few more hits out. Dodges on most of the damage from Anzo. And there's the arrow, but he's still getting out of harm's way. Good for him. So, damage numbers. 25,000 for Vala. Not top damage in the game. That honor still goes to Hanzo himself. But they are still doing some work. The turn in on the other hand, that could become a quick problem if Deathwing is allowed to complete the turn in. And they are zoning him away from it. In experience, they are fairly close, so it's not like any of the teams has a massive advantage here. And as Vala hasn't fallen yet, she's still relying on her auto attack speed. And once level 16 is ready, that could very well change the dynamic of the game. But for now, it is the red team that is having a bit more momentum here. And it's once again showing since the next Web Weaver wave is now traveling through the lanes in well, just a moment. But structurally, that's the one part where the blue team is actually ahead. And they are diving for X-Ray. And that's a kill. They should be able to get him here. X-Ray is dead. The question is, can they survive the rotation? Because it's... No, it's not coming. They decided that X-Ray would die anyway. So instead, they're moving down to the bottom of the map to take Sven out. And Sven has 21 gems. Yeah, they're moving in. Sven can run. He won't be able to hide. And he's going to lose all of the gems. It's just a matter of time. So, yeah. Zul goes down. No opportunity to survive through this. He's out. And so is the fort. They're defeating the Web Weavers everywhere else. Stitches now with another attempt to get a Gorge kill for the team. Hook is through. Gavlo moves out. But it's a 5 versus... Uh, it's a 4 versus 4 essentially now. If Vala is able to get some damage in, then maybe they have a chance. But this is still awkward because they have really split. There was a wedge driven between them. And it was pretty tricky for them to do anything about it. So now, as you can see, we have all of the forts about to be eliminated on the blue team side. As they are moving into the middle, they should be able to take this one out too. Just poking from a distance will already accomplish that. And Web Weavers at the bottom of the map have just now been destroyed. And top side, Vala has taken care of it as well. But the situation is still that an uh, advantage in structures is now on the side of the red team. So the space goofs in the driver's seat still. And barely the turn in. They lost a lot of gems to this. I mean, Zul alone at the bottom of the map lost 21, just to point that out again. But if you're now looking at the situation on the map, they can maybe get another turn in here for themselves if they pick a few more gems up. But the red team has done so much better. And every single time they lost the hero, they were also able to recover them quickly. The gems, so yeah. Raiders are a bit in an awkward position right now. Game number one looked amazing for them, and then everything just fell apart on all drag pass. Now they know about uh, Deathwing down at the bottom of the map. We're still looking at a Vala though, without any deaths. So that's the big one. No deaths on Vala is always huge. But right now, it's just a question on who gets the next turn in, and also who hits level 16. There's the root. Arrow gets dodged. Deathwing is flying in, but without the arrow connecting and the root. That's a bit of an awkward one. Once again, Disc is played against Stitches, who wanted to go for another Gorge here. Tranquility is already out. They're dodging most of the damage from Kalthas as well, and are forcing them back pretty easily here. And Nano's trying to turn in. Gets hooked and gorged, and that's a problem. Huge problem for Vala. Massive problem for her. Vala is in dire straits. Aegis gets used. Light Bomb doesn't connect, but the Gravity Lapse does. Nano on the way back out might survive, might not. Gets healed and turns it around with hit after hit against Deathwing and nearly gets the kill against him. So they are both on 16. That gives us now Manticore, and for Vala that means massive amounts of damage against Deathwing and Stitches. Deathwing and Stitches are not going to enjoy that at all. This is going to be really dicey for them. Both of them are going to hate this. Anduin now has a double D, so he turns into uh, the Pullout King. Two traits for him to save any target that gets into trouble. Most targets. Deathwing will still suffer because, again, Vala with Manticore. When she gets far flagged with Quiver, it's going to get even worse. But, yeah, Nano has not lost any attack speed. So it's all about those fights now. If Stitches hits these hooks, 
might change things. Once again, Lucky Hook is all that you need at the end of the day. But with Web Weavers, they're going to draw even in structures, and they're slowly getting there. So, really interesting game. Probably the most interesting map out of the three that we had so far. Stitches again, with an attempt at a gorge. Disc is being thrown out. Nice, good job. And they're defeating the Web Weavers there quickly, but again, forts are all destroyed now. And late game, I'd say, generally speaking, favors the blue team if they can keep stacking with Vala, if they can keep her alive. Her dying once or twice is honestly not that big of a deal, but you want to make sure that she doesn't look the entire auto attack advantage that she gets through the Gambit quest. And uh, Play is still looking for that hook. He's still hoping to get another hook gorge, and that light bomb combo that they've been playing with it is honestly quite nice. I like that a lot. I had a pretty cool touch. This is a risk, though. They didn't learn anything from game number two, as it seems. They're still going for the boss. And I'm not sure if the red team actually realizes they're moving away from it. Either they are saying, okay, we're not pushing into that point, or they don't realize that the boss is being taken. They're turning in instead. Boss is snuck in by the blue team. They risked it again, and they pulled it off this time. Okay. Boss is taken, turning is not gonna happen. Well, no, it is. So it's a boss at the top lane and they can defend against the Web Weavers. Damn. Talking about unexpected. But instead of defending, they're just going for the fight. There's Gorge and look how quickly Stitches is in trouble. Stitches gets attacked, gets absolutely melted. If not for... And he dies anyways. Anduin pulled him out twice and he died anyways. Vala is on a tear now. They're going for Kalthas. Yes, the Web Weavers are on the ground, but they got the boss at the top lane. And they know fully well that this is an opportunity to go for the top side keep. And they are going to take it. That's a lead in experience on the map now too. So, yep, they're doing work. They actually fell back. They realized... They played it safe. They were really aiming for the top side keep for a moment and just said, okay guys, let's defend instead. They're closing in on level 20. They have taken the lead in experience. Vala is at 150 stacks now. That is three rewards for a quest. But you can really tell in that team fight how quickly they've been managing to take out those main, that, well, the main hit point guys, specifically Stitches. I mean, Stitches got pulled out twice and he still died. They pulled him away twice and he got still murdered. So Vala now is just a problem a massive problem at that and it's going to continue because once she has far flight quiver she's going to be at a safer distance even she can stay away from them a bit longer than that so down at the bottom of the map still another camp about to be taken they're moving in for this one and yeah things are looking good there's the far flight quiver one level advantage one level lead that they're holding now these hooks, they are just not connecting for them. And it's getting dicey. Over here, we have Sven going for a camp. They don't have a full turn in yet, but they're honestly getting damn close to it. They are seven away from that. Seven. They miss seven gems, and then they can go for a Web Weaver wave. So, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> it's such a wild one. It's honestly a really wild game that we're seeing here. Vala is now at 40,000 damage. She's top damage on her team. They're slowly starting to get the turn-ins. Vala is still able to dodge the hook as it comes through. But, yep, that's the full turn-in. If Nano turns in, they got it. They're gonna get the Web Weavers. They're gonna get them now. They have level 20. And if they can break through here, if they can get the Web Weavers also on the ground before they have, before the opponent has level 20, they're even running the talent advantage. So, Stitches is attempting more and more hooks, but he does miss them. He just doesn't connect them. And wants to go for a Gorge. Ah, it's set up with an Hanzo arrow. Hanzo's arrow comes in. Disc against Kelthas, though. Eager is to save the day, but there's still a light bomb that they gotta deal with. Crankle is in trouble, but Vala is just tracking them. Um, Arrow after arrow, hit after hit, she kills two, Kalthas is gone, Deathwing is gone, the counter kill against Mayev is nice, but the problem is the more heroes are missing for the red team now, 
the less hero they have to defend against the Web Weavers. The top side keep is getting attacked. The one in the middle is already getting dropped too. And they are just losing everything here right now. The Raiders are on a tear. Bala is absolutely crushing it. She's murdering the hit point heavy heroes. Particularly Deathwing didn't stand a chance in the last fight. 50,000 damage now for Vala. She's getting closer and closer to top damage in the game as she's going for core directly. Stitches gets hits once more and they want the kill. Vala says thank you. I'm gonna take those numbers. Comes in, drops a couple more arrows in. Hanzo barely getting out and the core is already falling. Trouble is brewing as the Raiders are going for the 2-1 lead in the best of five series. Stitches falls. Vala on the top damage and that is game as the Raiders take the 2-1 lead against the Space Goofs in this best of five. GG and well played. Battlefield of Eternity, game number four and match point number one. Uh, we have the Space Goofs down one game in the series after they just lost in Tomb of the Spider Queen. And if I was the Raiders, I would currently ask myself, what would have happened if on all direct pass we would have gotten away with the boss push at the top? Or if we didn't go for the boss in the first place, like one of the two. Right now we have Samuro already banned and that's a little bit sad because I would have loved to see a Samuro play here by Sven. But we're going into Battlefield of Eternity and it's going to be pretty fun. I mean, I'm really, really liking it. Diablo comes in. We have a. I'm liking it because it's, it's a very aggressive map, right? You have a lot of team fights. You're going into the middle of the map, you're just fighting over the immortal. You can, of course, always try to just simply focus on the objective instead. But I really like what's going on there. So, uh, Sylvanas is already banned out. At the same time, we're now also looking at the final ban in the first phase before we're dropping into first pick first ban for the space goofs because as they lost the last map they have been the ones deciding that they want to have that advantage in uh, on the fourth map hoga he gets eliminated and off we go anna insta like it, not even like insta anna pick i could have seen liming as a first pick i would assume that liming gets now taken by the raiders she's still a great hero to play here and if you're talking about someone that can... I mean, to be fair, I think Chromie hasn't been played either. So you have a couple of mages around. It's not only Anna and Liming, but you have a few that you can still play here. No matter what gets taken by the blue team, there will be a nice target for uh, an auto boost. So, yeah, there's a lot. Varian is in. Medivh gets taken as well. And that's a brutal start because we're talking about a killer comp that is supported by medieve portals yeah that could be nasty etc and chromie they are both picked and that uh, with etc at least it allows you to portal control to an extent you also have it as a tool whenever the fight over the model breaks out and your opponent is going for your model you use etc to try and power slide them into a stun so there's a couple of things that they can do but, yeah, time will tell. But now we have Chen banned out. And, yeah, I'm kind of curious what we are going to get overall. Chen being banned doesn't really shock me too much because he's been played a bit more lately. Battlefield of Eternity as a map makes for a huge variety of possible playstyles. But most of the time you either have a killer composition that tries to delete the other team so that you can afterwards go for the objective. Or you're just trying to have the superior poke. Banning out Sonya makes also a lot of sense, but for me personally, the curious thing is just what we're now getting in regards to damage. Again, I believe Li Ming is still up. I also think Jaina is still available. So talking mages that can follow up on Varian's taunt shouldn't really be a big uh, problem for them. There's plenty around. I wonder if they are also... Cons There's Li Ming. Stukov as a follow-up too. If anything, I'm a bit surprised that Stukov didn't get banned. I mean, it's really telegraphed when you're going for Varian and Medivh in your uh, first rotation, what you're trying to do here. I like that, though. Melganis, so probably ETC played by Dequaza and Melganis pushed over to the main tank. Okay. That's a pretty good front line. Melganis is insanely annoying. He's super annoying. That leaves us with Chia as the final pick. And, well, we're getting Lunara, the Bambi. 
Bambi in the house. Final pick for Sven. Guys, again, this is match point. Match point number one for the Raiders. So either the red team now claims that we're going the distance with map number five, or we have the Raiders victorious with a 3-1 on Battlefield of Eternity. We'll figure that out right now on the fourth map of the Special 5 series with Sven coming in on the last pick. They still need a side laner. And the choice is Artanis. All right, attendance is in the house. Let's go. Battlefield of Eternity, everybody. Our fourth map in the best of five. Game number four. Vinland Raiders on the left with a 2-1 lead. We get Gavlo on Liming, Crankle on Varian, Nan on Mediv. We have Hunter Arc with, Art, uh, sorry, Stukov and Sven on Atenas. Now, there we go. And on the right side of the map, the Space Goofs. Play is play Melganis. We got X-Ray on Anna, Chia on Lunara. Yasu is playing Chromie and Dequaza on ETC. So, still waiting for. Oh, there we have it. So, they indeed go for amateur opponent with Atanas. It should be a given on Battlefield of Eternity, but I think the other day like, we had one or two Atanas players that instead wanted to go into more of a battle oriented damage or build with him and not into immortal damage. So, ever since then, I'm just a little bit on the cautious side whenever we get the pick to see if they're maybe changing things up. But yeah. But now we got Time Walker's Pursuit. We also have on top of that the Time Defeat for Malganis. He's obviously pretty brutal. And yeah, we're good to go. Four men at the bottom of the map getting ready. We're keeping an eye on Mediv as per usual agreement to see if he's able to get all of his stacks together as Chromie is hoping for quick kills. And going up against Lunara and Chromie is super annoying. I mean, it really is. You have Lunara slowing things down. You have Chromie trying to capitalize on all these slows, getting those attacks in one after another. And it's always a massive pain in the butt when anything like that happens. So we'll see how deep they can go with all of that. If they can maybe take Mediv out, for example, this would of course be the dream if they somehow can pull this off but well as they're already starting with the action we're having the quick attacks coming in and they might get even uh, well a little bit on the wall I mean again if they are somehow able to get a kill against Mediv, that would be great but it's already tricky enough for him to get the stacks together in the first place simply because of how this game is currently playing out so it's not gonna be made easy for him in any way shape or form down at the bottom of the map still trying to play this out as best as they possibly can we're also looking at a camp that is being heavily fought over i mean both of the teams are really going bananas on this one but I guess we're gonna get the hit now. Yeah, Chromie coming in. Portals are also trying to save the day for them as they're moving from one side to another. Things are getting a bit spicy though and it's Liming that dies first and the camp goes to the red team too. First blood is in the house. In addition to that, we're getting a camp claimed and they're pulling ahead. Yeah, the red team is not willing to give this one up just yet. They still think they can force game number five and then turn all of that around. So, good stuff. At least Mediv didn't fall. That's the good news for them. He's at 12 stacks right now. Early level 4 for uh, the Space Goofs. And that gives us for Lundara the Nature's Culling. And with level 4 on the side of the blue team, we then could finally get Taunt so that they can try and follow up with Stukov's Lurking Arm on a Taunt, get Liming into play. This is where Varian turns into an actual hero and not an oversized minion. And there we have it. So yeah. Taunt is in the house. We got it now. And we also got the Charge Blast. Okay, Charge Blast for Liming. And it is Immortal Time. First objective in the game. And we are good to go for some action down here. Lunara, of course, with all of the poison and acid, is immediately making some moves. And they're getting good damage in. As the Taunt comes through against Chromie, Crankle is aiming for her. So is Liming. They want the kill. And they should be able to get it. And they do. Mediv, the one to take the final hit against her. And the Chromester is defeated as Artanis is still making plays for the red team's Immortal. And will likely win them the halftime show by a small margin. But he's about to take it. And it is... Yeah, it's indeed the blue team that takes it. 
And they're also looking for more kills and they're finding them. No, they're not. They're losing Li Ming. Lunara takes Li Ming down with the help of Malganis. Oh, and Chromie is already back. So yeah, that's definitely bad news. They're trying to take the Immortal down, but it's a race at the end of the day and the blue team is not going to be able to take this one. Even with Atanas and everybody moving in for it, they don't stand a chance. They're missing it out by 600 points. It's not a lot. It's a tiny shield, but yeah, it was getting a bit obvious there at some point. Once that they lost Luna, uh, not Luna, Liming, they were in trouble. So right now we have 20 stacks at least for Medivh. If he can keep himself alive, that's a good start. Top side, Atanas is still pushing. Sven by now also with a shield battery. The problem that they're also facing is that again the red team is taking the advantage in experience and translate that into a quick talent advantage. So now we're having the immortal burn down quickly, still doing a solid amount of damage against the opponent's fort. Yeah, and so is Chromie. I mean, damn, she is really firing away. They might even get the uh, the fort if they are poking it out a bit more. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here, not only with Chromie but also with Lunara. Level 7 just came in way too late. So the Raiders, yep, they got level 7 way too late and they're suffering the consequences therefore as this one is out. Top side, we still got Malganus, so he's actually now sitting against Sven. So they've been swapping them around a little bit. They moved their Quasa down to the bottom of the map. I think they're still rotating back away and that's, yep, what we're seeing. So um, uh, ETC being played at the bottom of the map for just a second, but now they're moving him towards the top again with Malganus following in his footsteps. Level 10 for Chromie is now ready since she's hit uh, level 8. Quest is still, for Medivh, Quest is still halfway done. But at least they're getting a camp here. So they got something. Got a bit. But in the meantime, we're now looking at a game that comes down a bit more with a lead for the space groups that could very well get them level 10 around objective number 2. And that's always the big risk. They go for the taunt, they have the follow-up, and they miss out on the kill. But this is exactly the kind of comp that you want. You want to come in with the taunt. Li Ming fires away everything she has, and Stukov moves in with his lurking arm to make it nearly impossible for the opponent to move back out of the fight. That's exactly the kind of play that you want to make there. They nearly got a kill, but they just barely missed out on it. Unfortunate for them, but they're making another move. Lunara also still alive. You can see the threat potential here from the blue team, but it's not enough to give them reliable kills just yet. And yeah, they have to be super careful now because again, level 10 is going to be close. The objective is already up on the map and you want to either get kills now or you want to go for the immortal. You have to make a choice here eventually because once the opponent has heroics, you need to fall back out. So they're trying to fight. They're forcing the fights as they're still on eye level with them. Stukov is eating some damage. Atanas is now coming in. They're still half a level behind. Looks for the swap. Finds the swap. Gets Chromie. They're trying to take her down. She goes for the timeout, but she will still fall. Chromie is out once again. They get the important kill. That gets them a bit closer and experience too. And more swaps and more damage. This time it's Dequaza that's in trouble. And they get another kill. All of a sudden, the Raiders turning the game around a bit here. I like it. Job well done. Three kills to two, maybe closer to level 10 now as well. And they go for the halftime show. This was important. This was really important for them. There's the heroics though. Halftime show, they lost out on it. But they're sending Li Ming now down to the bottom of the map, trying to get some experience here for level 10. She gets it quickly, and Atanas has done the same up at the top. They are losing some ground here though, because the red team, they realize that they have a positional advantage because of level 10, and they moved in immediately. Leyline already utilized. They try another kill. This time they're going for Ana. She's in trouble, and still gets out. ETC with the dance party. It's a party, baby, and everybody's dropping low. <laughs> Li Ming survives, and ETC gets killed by Artanis. Viable, viable. Artanis getting some value for them, but, well, spoiler alert, they're still losing the Immortal. 32 stacks now for Nano on Medivh. Four kills to three. They got the kills in, but they lost Li Ming, and now they're up against the Immortal in danger of losing their second fort. 
So, yeah. They're making, they're making a lot of effort to get back into this. And they are closing gaps all over the place. But then it's just not enough. They lose the Immortal again. And now they have to defend here. Yeah, but they're going for Chromie. Timeout is once again forced. Artanis with his ult. They're trying to get the kill. Can't quite. And Taunt isn't ready yet. Taunt isn't ready. Gavlo. Gavlo! Yeah, he's dead. He's definitely dead. He is so dead. Liming is gone. And they're losing the top four. Now they just have to retreat. They gotta get out of here. They gotta get out. They're trying. And they will make it happen. Well, I thought they would. But they don't. Because Artanis is doing what he does best. He's dead. Not viable. Not viable. So, yeah. Apparently it's not viable after all. Now, Medivh at least is going to complete his quest now. Well, he should. He isn't? <laughs> he's missing one. Just one. One single stack and he's going to be fine. Still not there yet though. Five kills to four. Still moving around here in an attempt to, uh, uh, well, catch them at some point, I suppose. They're all at the top and they've just taken the cam. Once that Medif drops down and gets a single connect with the hero, he is going to be fine on this baseline quest. Maybe that's the one move that turns the game around for them. Now, I would say that the worst is now over for the blue team because they lost both of their forts. They went past level 10. The big problem with the talent advantage on the objective for the space groups is now over. And, yeah, the bigger question is, of course, from here on out, what happens when we have the same talent and they can actually take these fights right from the start. We have Jaseka at the top with Lunara still. But they're also getting a bit more careful now. There's only half a level until 13, and a level 13 talent advantage is also not that big of a deal. I mean, it's always an advantage, it's always a lead. But there's a big difference between you having a lead on level 10 and level 13. So now we got 19,000 for Liming. 33,000 for Lunara, so big damage numbers for the red team. They're forcing the fight again because there's still no level 13. Still a talent disadvantage. Blue team shouldn't really force this too much. They're a bit tempted to move in with another taunt, I suppose. But there's not that much experience missing. So now that the objective gets announced, you're probably better off just going for XP, move in, get level 13, and then really going for the fight here. And if Li Ming at any point is able to get herself a few resets, she could really carry the fight. But she's been the primary target. Oh, goes into Glass Cannon? Damn, the balls on that girl. Gavlo, really? You were, you were killed four times already and you're going Glass Cannon? I mean, okay, if they can keep her alive, fair enough. But she was the prime target, so at most of these fights, and he got killed four times out of five. So that's a ballsy pick, given the circumstances. Medif is about to kill complete his quest, I suppose. Yep, he's done now. So that's going to be good news for them. Immortal is still being attacked. Camps at the top and the bottom of the map. Shaman Camps doing their thing. So here it is, the play for another kill. They're moving in for Dequaza and try to drop him. Chiaseka is also a bit low. Leyline misses completely, but they're getting damage against Lunara through at least. The top side is a bit of a problem. They might even lose the keep here if that continues because that Shaman Camp is wreaking havoc up there. So blue team is losing more and more ground. They're desperately trying to close it by getting some kills. But this is a disaster. This keep is gone. They're losing the keep 100%. They're getting a kill on ETC. I mean, congratulations, what are you going to do with that? You just lost your keep, or you're in the process of losing it, and while that happens, your opponent took the Immortal. Even if they could save it, like maybe they can. Maybe the keep, the, the minions all drop dead in a moment, but then what? So down here, they're trying to just take the Immortal out as quickly as possible. Get a few more kills while ETC is gone. It's a 4 versus 4. Nano is low. And Gavlo is about to die. Yeah, Mr. I died four times and still picked Glass Cannon is getting wrecked again. Uh, yeah. The Space Goofs, they're done goofing around. They want to go for game here. They go for Nano. He gets dropped as well. And that is just the beginning of the disaster. Yeah, topside keep is lost. Keep at the bottom of the map is 100% going to get destroyed now. There's no saving that anymore. And with zero keeps, even if the game doesn't end here, even if the game doesn't end here, I do not believe that they can bring this back. How would you? It's nearly going to be impossible for them to uh, pull this one off. 
So, yeah, the attacks, they keep coming. They might go for Malganus. They might take him, but the keep is still gone. 16 is on the board. Keep is gone. And now you're just going to be pummeled into the ground by catapults. 14 minutes in. Yeah. I just don't see it. Like, how do you come back in this situation? Unless Li Ming just bunny hops through them with one kill after another, reset after reset, there's no way to go from here. If there's a fight breaking out over the next Immortal, there's going to be catapults pushing with every single wave. Now, again, they haven't taken a single fort out. They have no counter pressure. None. There's no catapults for the blue team. And for the red team, we're having one with every single wave right now. This is going to be impossible for them to turn. I just don't believe for a second that they can do anything with that. So, unless there's a miracle happening, I don't know what they can do. I, I really don't. All the red team has to do is play this slow. Not YOLO. Not go Leroy Jenkins on them and just play this cool, calm, and connected. That is literally all they gotta do from here on out. Don't int. <laughs> this, is, this is literally the only thing. Just don't int. As long as you don't int here, you're fine. 16 versus 16, don't get forced into a stupid fight that you don't want. And don't allow your opponent to just simply snowball this for no reason whatsoever. That's the only objective. Catapults are already on the core. There's already catapult on the core. The minion wave is going to defeat this. But again, as the longer the next fight over the immortal lasts, the more catapults are going to accumulate over there. And the shield is going to get dropped. We're 15, 16 minutes into the game. So slowly these things are starting to do damage. Talking about damage, we have 45,000 for Lunara. Liming uh, to uh, compare that quickly, even with glass cannons at 30k. That's all that she was able to contribute thus far. And yeah, party continues. There's at least a camp at the bottom of the map that they have, but top side, that's also where we're seeing Shabans for the red key, the team. So, another one. And, yeah. Tough luck. They can just slow this down, and it's all that they gotta do. Slow the game, and then make your play. Poke a bit with Lunara, poke with Chromie from a distance. You can already see the problem at the bottom of the map with the catapult that is coming closer. At the top side is even worse. Now they go for Nano. If, of course, they are even winning the fight, the red team now, then that would be the end of it. Nano boosts to Lunara. I always knew she was boosted. But they are coming in quickly, pushing the blue team back. Core is soon going to get attacked, and they are losing time. They're losing ground. They need a kill. They need it now. And I'm not sure they're getting it. Nope. Instead, it's Liming that dies. Glass Cannon Liming is dead, Stukov is gone, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is it? This game, we're going to game number five. Medivh is dead as well, and the Minions are already on the core. Catapult and Minions are going for it straight away. We are going the distance on this one. The grand final of qualifier number five goes to the final map. We are going to map number five with this party. The Space Goof, they are able to win it on Battlefield of Eternity. Absolutely no chance anymore for the Raiders to bring this home. And, well, that's all she wrote. So, the Raiders go down on Battlefield of Eternity. We are going into game number five and we'll decide which team takes the victory in the fourth qualifier for the Banshee Cup. GG. The final map, the series is tied, the grand final ends on Infernal Shrines. We have the Raiders going up against the Space Goofs once again. And I gotta give some credit to the red team. They have done a pretty exceptional job bringing this back time and time again. Over and over, the Raiders have taken the lead and then things turned. So now we're heading into the final map. Which also means that there is actually a fair amount of heroes that are now unavailable because you only can play hero once within a series. So still plenty of stuff to go around. We're not, uh, we're not shying away from picking supports because they're all of a sudden all banned. But it's definitely going to get a bit more interesting what the teams are picking from here on out. 
I would still assume that Sylvanas is going to get banned because they've been banning Sylvanas ever since the first map. And obviously, as you move from one map to another, she becomes more and more powerful. And it will have to be the space groups that ban her because the raiders would do nothing. I mean, they would prefer nothing more than now going into a Sylvanas pick. Tychus gets banned. So no Odin on Inferno Shrines now. And whoa, they ban Diablo. Sylvanas is now officially up as a potential first pick. Yeah, that should be a shoe in, right? I mean, that's a lock right there. No? Apparently, they didn't expect that. So, they are hesitating. If they don't pick Sylvanas. Oh, wow, they go for the Haka first. Okay. Space Grooves are definitely going to lock her in. I gotta assume that the teams are at this point really going to be eager to take her. So. Here we are. Dehaga is in play as the number one pick. And now the question how the red team reacts to it. They have the double pick here for Infernal Shrines. And yes, this is going to be a spicy game. Tyriel and Carrigan. They are all letting Sylvana slide. They've been banning her out in every single game so far as one of the first bans. And now on the final map, they're all looking at what's still available, what kind of comps they go for. And we get Chogal. <laughs> Shogal is in the house. I assume that Sylvanas is now going to get banned, but we have Dehaka and we have Jogal. Tyriel Carrigan against it. Yep, things are starting to get a bit crazy here. The Raiders with the double trouble. <laughs> okay, they ban Alexstrasza. They get rid of her. Good ban, for sure. Life Binder is insanely annoying if you have Chogal on the same team. So they are making sure that that's not a combo that can be played against them. Still a couple of supports around, but we'll see. Instantly, we have the final ban now. And if you are looking at Tyriel plus Carrigan, I mean, what are you really going to get rid of them? They are, they are banning Sylvanas. I'm still a little bit sad. This is the Banshee Cup. We win the grand final. We win the best of five. And Sylvanas is getting banned over and over again. Nobody picks her. That is just cruel. It's unbelievably cruel. Shogal is in the house, though. And um, I'm here for it. We are having the final picks coming in for the red team slowly. I mean, at this point, they really got to... They have to pick a support right now. They have to pick a support. Just false that, and I suppose it's going to be a support play. They go for the gut cane. They're limiting the options also a bit on what exactly the blue team can now take together with Chogal in order to create even more synergy. Now, with Chogal in the house, there's obviously always a question on what exactly is going to happen regarding counter picks. And they banned Malthale and Tigers. And honestly, at the time, I didn't really think too much about it. I looked at it and was like, okay, this is still fine. This is also nuts, by the way. When game number five and Brightwing is still up, I mean, are you shitting me? Brightwing is up and they go Zagara together with it. Boy, oh boy. Zagara, Chogal. Zagara would have been another potential pick against Chogal because of the Hydra talents later. But that leaves us with Dequaza. Final pick for the Grand Final. The Space Goofs now for Infernal Shrines. What are they choosing against Chogal? The double trouble is coming and we get Thrall. Here we go, everybody. Infernal Shrines, the final map in the best of five series in the grand final of qualifier number four for the Banshee Cup. Prepare for trouble and make it double. On the left, the Raiders here on Infernal Shrines with Sven on the Haka. Crankle is playing Gull. We got Hunterhawk on Brightwing, Gavlo on Cho and Nano on Zagara. On the right side of the map, the Space Goofs with Play on Tyriel, Chia Seca on Carrigan. We got X-Ray on Deckard, Kane as their support choice. Dequaza is playing Thrall in the fifth game of the series. And Yazu is playing Falstead. Let's go! Well, we got Gafnikl. <laughs> That's a nice Shogal name, Gafnikl. The best Chogal name that I ever saw was in a tournament that I casted, and I think it was a tournament on the Korean server. And there was one team, there was a lot of teams that were just simply there, you know, like, not really top players, but they were just trying to have some fun. And there was one team that was clearly on a mission, and the mission was to uh, get casted at some point. And they did cast it, I casted them, and they picked Chogal, 
and I didn't think anything about it, but it was becoming very quickly clear as we ended the game what they wanted from that tournament because their Shogar name was Gay Orgy. <laughs> There's still a clip on Twitch, but it's just so glorious. I mean, if you ever make it into my Twitch channel, <laughs> make sure that you use the command exclamation mark Chogal with a hyphen between Cho and Gal, and you're going to get that clip because I just died at that moment. You could see the second that you ended the game that these guys had one mission and one mission only. That was to sneak onto a stream, play Chogal, and go for the gay orgy. <laughs> and it was glorious. <laughs> So yeah, kudos to them. They actually pulled it off. But yeah, over here we get Garfnickel. Garfnickel is going to try and win the game for the blue team as everybody on the side of the Space Goofs is now invading the camp. And boy, are they going for early game shenanigans. Hot Dog and Brightwing gets out. What is this fight? Look at this battle. The red team takes it. They're locking it in. No kill. How did nobody die? How long did that fight last? Not a single person died in that entire encounter. That's crazy. That's just absolutely crazy. Nobody died, nobody got dropped, and they stole the camp away. So one single siege camp has not been taken, one Kazra camp eliminated, and it went to the red team. As the blue team is using Chogal to just barrel through the middle wall as a bot wall, doing mad amounts of damage over here and of course as the game continues Shogar is going to be an absolute beast they get Nano spreading creep all over the place like he's the incarnation of Jadong and they are getting vision, they're getting control this is looking honestly for the early game this is looking pretty good for the team in, uh, in blue they lost the camp granted but they have the Haka at the top, they have a global aspect to all of this, so this gives them a bit of a lead on top of everything else that they're already running here. Shrines are going to be very interesting, and obviously once that level 10 kicks in, we're going to see how exactly the comp is being played on uh, the, uh, the red team side, because the space goofs, they have a lot of potential combos to play out here. With Sundering, Carrigan Stun, uh, Sanctification, and a few more tools, they can really do a whole lot of work to snipe some targets, but a late game Chogal is always a menace and proving that already at the bottom of the map is uh, Gaffnickel with some bright wing support as they are starting to take that fort pretty low and this fort is losing hit points and losing them quickly so yeah trouble is definitely brewing over here and a lot of trouble at that Shogal just pushing this out time and time again Thrall is trying to now play it out with the Frost Wolf pack. The idea for Thrall is obviously to combo that level 4 talent with level 16 Alpha Wolf, which is going to help him to do more damage against Shogal as the game continues. Uh, if they're getting to that point in the game, there will be more of a threat level from Thrall against Shogal. And they're already trying to take him down right here. Hunter still with some additional heals. So they're trying to make the move and... Uh, Initial camp clear goes to the red team, so they are these advantageous when they are talking about the points. Now on top of that, we got Swift Retribution coming in, we also got Secret Weapon, we got Ancestral Wrath. That at least is a nice little nuke that they now have at their disposal. And the Punisher is indeed taken by the red team. So bottom of the map, false dead. he's mirroring this. Did I say a second ago that the Haka is the only global in the game? I'm obviously drunk. Like, the day has been too long. They have false stats. So, yeah, they got a global on each side. Brightwing coming in. Am I a joke to you? Yes, you definitely are. You are a joke. You've always been a joke. You always will be a joke. You have disgusting magic spit and you have invisible friends on level 20. So, nobody likes you. Go home, Brightwing. Just go home. Punisher goes down. And they're trying to go for a quick kill. Nobody has died in this entire game yet. We're five minutes into the game. Nobody has died. Not a single person. And that's changing right now with Thrall getting eliminated and losing the few stacks that he was able to get himself on level 4. Five minutes. First one to fall is Dequaza. Sven moving away from Carrigan and the push at the top still continues. It's the same picture, honestly. With the objective, there was at least some structural damage done by the Space Goofs, but whenever it's just the heroes on the map, Chogar is wrecking things. The, uh, he has destroyed the bottom wall and nearly destroyed the fort, and now he's doing the entire thing at the top lane once again. So yeah, damage is coming through with level 7. We got the Org Rampage, we got the Enraged Regeneration, and they are doing so much work here.
It's nasty. If level 10 doesn't turn the momentum, then the space goofs are in dire straits. So yeah, level 10 is in. We get Sundering. We get the Ultralisk. Everything that we expected. The only one that has made a choice yet, and this is honestly the only question mark, is Tyrael. Is Tyrael going for... No, he's going for Sanctification. No judgment, he's going for Sanct. We get more... We get the Hammer of Twilight, and we got the Twisting Nether, and now we're gonna go for the big parties, particularly on the Shrine. So, yeah. Already they're making a move. Nice! Beautiful kill on Carrigan. The Haka starting things up with the Tong, and then the follow-up was there immediately. So, fantastic play by them. As they get two kills to zero. Still level 11 for both of the teams, so it's not like anybody's pulling heavily ahead here. Might change, though, as structures are getting targeted again. Zagara, of course, is also getting good damage out. Particularly siege damage. And still working on that creep spare time and time again. But, yep, they are poking that four down. One uh, Leaden Orb at a time. Two stacks for Thrall. Still trying to complete this, of course. It's also attacked and quickly poly too. But... Seems like the Raiders are definitely set to try and win this one now. They've been the ones in the lead time and time again and just simply couldn't really break through properly. But now a chance to do the same once more unless the Space Goofs bring it back. And they can. I mean, the Space Goofs are obviously strong enough that they can definitely pull that one off. But yeah, we'll have to see if they are really able to murder them here in one of the team fights over the shrine if they can maybe win it through the objective that's obviously always another advantage that you might have that the objective is working really well for you and you can uh, get the action done there but now we have all the way up at the top right still camps to be claimed we have the shaman cam coming in as well at the top with yazo defeating it very quickly but that also allows for the blue team to get a position on the shrine a bit earlier and yeah they're moving into the middle for another kill carrigan is dead Carrigan is down. Deckard Kane taking some damage too as he retreats. They are going again for the objective. And things are just looking better and better for the blue team. They're making one good move after another. Really some big plays here. Three kills to zero. Early level 13 for them now. Red team is trying to rotate around towards the top in order to get at least something done here. But the Haka is already global back towards the fort. So he's not even caught out of position or anything. Still trying to defend here. We get the Twilight Nova and we got the Surging Dash now. And since they are about to take... Uh, Brightwing helping out at the top. Another quick drag happening against... Yeah, Falstad. But yeah, bot side, that's a wholly different story. We now got two versus two at the top. But Shogal has now claimed the Mortar Punisher with Zagara. Can still move away here. And then at the bottom of the map, of course, the Punisher is now moving in and will definitely take down that four that is already so incredibly low that there's just no saving it anymore. They're not even trying, and for good reason. They know that this is not happening. So, yeah, this one gets destroyed easily. Same time, the push in the middle continues. And if nobody takes care of the Punisher at the bottom of the map, then things might get fully out of control down there. Falset is the one that finally starts to move in for it because they have to set someone in there or damage on the keep is guaranteed. And you definitely want to attempt to prevent that at least from happening. So, here we go. More damage in the middle of the map as they are aiming for fort number two. They're also looking at Thrall. And, well, they might get some damage in. Yeah, maybe not enough. They got Kane in trouble. X-Ray has to be super careful here. Yeah, they're going for Chogal, Brightwing, Sundering, and a quadruple more. A quad more for the team. And they go for They got Kane. They can't get the kill against him. Carrigan with the Chrysalis as she's trying to stay alive. I'm still shocked by how few kills we have in this game. It's nuts. Absolutely uh, nuts. So, with that, we still have not a single kill for the red team. They might finally be able to pull something off against Chogal and... Yeah, there it is! They go down, it's a double kill! <laughs> finally a sign of life! But how crazy is it that we have so few kills here? We just had a four-man more and nobody died when it uh, went over. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. Carrigan gets still killed, so despite the fact that Shogal is off the map, they get a kill against Carrigan, and they're trying for Teriel too. Even Deckard Kane might be in trouble. 
Yeah, Sven with a really nice attempt here for the Elder Druins. Falls at least value. Value stat. Top side. Yasu. Yep. Working those order attacks in and gets it. Yeah, do we get the Tong? Maybe, maybe not. Right wing is there. Now the Tong is. Nah, I was about to say guaranteed, but <laughs> maybe I was a little bit too quick on that. So, yeah. Really well done now. We got Nano still pushing this out here. I mean, Falser has made some good moves. He gusted earlier when the Maw was being hit over here. He moved then towards the top side and got the big damage in on uh, the fort. Took that out, so that was big. But Stick Scene gives us now the Frenzied Fists. And we got the Leaden Orb after the Twilight Nova. And here comes finally the Alpha Wolf for Thrall. That might... I mean... It's a good start, right? It's at least a little bit of extra damage that they now have against Chogal, so that might help them here. But generally speaking, if you have Chogal in a game, the longer the game lasts, the more momentum he picks up, the deeper in the late game he goes, the harder it usually is to deal with him. Looking at the damage numbers, we have Gal on 34,000 damage, Zagara's on 32k, so both of them pretty high up there with Cho himself on 28,000. That's still more than the highest damage dealer on the red team side, which is Falstad at 25. So, yeah, they are definitely dishing out the pain here. And Kerrigan, she didn't really have the game that they were looking for just yet. She died three times and is struggling to uh, find her footing here. So now we have four kills against two overall. Next objective is coming up and we are 12 minutes into the game. So things are starting to hurt a little bit more here. They gotta do a bit more about it. Uh, Carrigan with the quest already done. Level 17 for both teams and it is objective time again. Gaffnickel needs to start to make a little bit move over there. Gets zoned away from Tyrael for a moment. And Carrigan gives the red team an initial lead. But now everybody's jumping on the shrine. It's gonna be a massive party over here. Chogal. Yeah, looking for Carrigan again. Big hits coming. Good damage too. Deckard Kane doing his best to get one potion out after another. As they are charging in. And the damage comes through. Not enough yet, but Carrigan, for example, finds herself in trouble. Sanctification saving her for a second, but not long enough. Gets zoned away by the more even. And then Carrigan goes down. And that's a five versus four. The kill against Zagara to even the odds a bit. But Tyriel, can he get away? They got Kane can't, but Tyriel was at least able to get out of arm's way. They want the kill though. They want Falstead, they want Thrall, they want something here, and they get the War Chief. Thrall is gone. Topside needs to be defended against. And they are going to send, I suppose, the Haka back, but everyone else still on the shrine. And that is seven kills against three now, and will mark the end of the mid lane fort. They're going to get it right here, right now, and then they can move in for the fort. Zagara is not back yet, so with 39, I actually expected them to wait this out even a bit more to make sure that Zagara can come back in. But they want to take on the top four too. <laughs> and yeah, Choka. Choka is just taking it. Choka doesn't care. Choka comes in and is like, yeah, well, Ford, who cares? Takes it out immediately. Can always get healed up by Brightwing. The one in the middle of the map is a uh, foregone conclusion, of course. So, yeah, off we go. All forts destroyed. A two fort advantage, therefore, for the Raiders right now. They still hold the one in the middle and at the bottom of the map. Yeah, and now they can break to the wall. Can take this one on. Punisher gets baited over onto the other side. Nice comp by carry again. Not nice enough. Brightwing with the heal. Where's the heal? Where's the heal? Brightwing got interrupted. She got interrupted by Sundering. Brightwings, they got interrupted by the Sundering. They get at least a false that counter kill. But they're gonna lose more now. There's the kill against Zagara, and they're going for... Oh, oh, they lose Thrall. I was just about to say, they're going for the entire team here and trying to take all of them out, but yeah. Hunter Orc still dashes away, and damn, they save both of them. Dehaka and Brightwing are both safe. Good on them. And this middle keep has not been destroyed, but it has taken damage. So, not too shabby. Brightwing... Her getting stunned by Sundering was big. That was huge. That was really the winning move in that last fight. If not for that, Shogal survives. 
Now they got the Holy Arena, we get World Breaker, and we got Wind Tunnel. But obviously, you're now in that spot where you won a few fights, you killed Chugal twice, but you still find yourself in this weird and awkward position where you're on structures, you are trailing far behind. And team fights generally outside of these like little Nicky picks that they pulled off aren't going too well for them. Brightwing has gone for the invisible friends again. I mean, they could have called that uh, talent the imaginary friends because there's no invisible heroes on the map and Brightwing doesn't have any friends and we are fully aware of all of that. So, uh, 55,000 damage for Gal in the meantime. And yeah, Gaffnickel is going to need a bit of help here, maybe. Uh, Brightwing with a slight heal, all right. Already trying to play this out, but the Haka is now coming in too. There's the Gust. And Shogun has to be a bit careful. Again, he didn't go for Molten Core or anything, so he's fully relying on Brightwing. And, well, yeah, they're fine. <laughs> the bird is down, so is Tyriel. And little spoiler alert here, I think this is also going to spell out the fate of the keep in the middle. At least if they're taking... Yeah, they're, they're going for the keep. And I don't think they can be stopped here. World Breaker is in. Super small cooldown, obviously, but look how quickly they're focusing their attention now onto Thrall. They want to take him on, and they might even get the kill. There's a nice Maw again against two. So, can they get something out of it? Shogun is moving in right away. They go for the Quasa, they go for X-Ray. The Haka is a bit low, but so is the keep. And, well, as the Haka falls and they sacrifice him, they still have an opportunity to go for the keep and take it apart, and that's exactly what they're doing. The keep is gone, and Gaffnagel is still fighting here. But he's having a problem, and that's a lack of hit points. Brightwing with a little save. Might now be caught himself. They go for Thrall and they actually take him down. What? And they want to go for Core. Shogal, you can't stop him. Prepare for trouble, make it double, and the big fat ogre is just wrecking things. They might not end the game here, but they're definitely starting to damage the core. It's already down to 77%. They're going for Chogal. I think eventually he has to move back here, right? No, he doesn't. He goes for Fallstead again. He falls that didn't even use his bloody Gust. Why? Why? Just Gust it out. But this is game. The Raiders. The Raiders take down the Space Goops and win the fourth qualifier for the Banshee Cup. Congratulations.